from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, the Post has been a proud sponsor of the National Book Festival since its inception in 2001 with the Library of Congress, of course, and we're happy to maintain this relationship and tradition under our new ownership. I had never met Nick Koch until just now, but we were sort of colleagues once removed. We both have been working at the Post, but at different times. His distinguished career includes stints at the Des Moines Register, where he won a Pulitzer Prize for national reporting, and at the Washington Post. His many other awards include the Sigma Delta Chi Award for Washington Correspondence and two Robert F. Kennedy Awards. His books include Wild Blue Yonder, Money, Politics, and the B-1 Bomber, and Let Them Meet Promises, The Politics of Hunger. His latest book, The Harness Maker's Dream, Nathan Callison and the Rise of South Texas, is a more personal uh, work than some of his others. It takes a look at immigration as reflected in the adventures of his own grandfather, who left Ukraine at the turn of the 19th century, when he was just 17, to seek a better future in America. One of two million Jews who fled the pogroms of Tsarist Russia in the 19th century, Callison exemplifies the contributions made to the American 20th century by Jews in particular and immigrants in general. As a kid, Nick Kotz spent plenty of time with his grandfather, Nathan, but like many of us, he lacked the perspective and the patience to sit there and quiz the old man about all, the, all that he'd seen and done. Fortunately, the grown-up Nick Kotz has used his reporter's skills to dig up enough information to provide a rich portrait of a man and his era. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Nick Kotz. Good afternoon. It's wonderful to be with you all today. Question, how many in this audience have made a uh, serious effort to trace the history of their families back to the time when they came to the United States? A lot of people. How many of you have thought about doing this and maybe started, but uh, didn't follow through on it. It was too complicated. I think we have an audience of genealogists. I've been a reporter for quite a few decades as a reporter for The Post and for the Des Moines Register, I was known as an investigative reporter, uh, which had to do with uh, getting the bad guys and investigating corruption in government. But in a broader sense, investigative reporting uh, really is thorough reporting. It's getting to the bottom of things. And I've spent a career writing about the big events, the wars, elections, presidencies, uh, boom and bust, depressions, floods, the stories that appear on page one. And all the time that I was doing this, uh, the thought never occurred to me to look in to see what my own family's history would tell me, not only about the family, but about America. It was an incredible experience. I want to tell you a little bit about it, but I also want to talk to you about how, with the incredible communications revolution and the use of the internet, it is, things can be done today on any subject, but in the field of investigating family histories, the last two, three, four years have made it possible for amateurs without any experience 
to get into the internet and to find remarkable things, including about their own families. I got into this in an in a unexpected way. My grandfather was a pioneer rancher in South Texas near San Antonio. And a few years back, uh, it would have pleased him a lot. The most beautiful part of his ranch in the Texas Hill Country became part of the Texas Park System. It is a wonderful area of rolling hills and all kinds of wildlife, fauna. It's a gorgeous, romantic place. I had, as a kid, I went there, but I never thought about its history. Why didn't I? I was a history buff, I thought. I got an A plus in Texas history. I was the wise ass eight year old who at family gatherings reported on what went on in World War II last week. I lived with my grandparents. My mother and I lived with my grandparents the first 14 years of my life. And yet, when I got that telephone call asking me to do some history about that ranch, I knew far more about the Alamo, Sam Houston, and the Texas Revolution, far, far more than I knew about my own grandparents and the revolution that they had escaped from in Russia. The telephone call was from the chairman of Texas Parks and Wildlife. And she told me, she said, I understand you're a writer. We need someone to write the history of these 10, 12 ranches that comprise this magnificent Government Canyon natural area. Would you do that for us? And I said, no, I can't do that. Uh, I was in the middle of researching a book called Judgment Days, Lyndon Baines Johnson, Martin Luther King, and the laws that changed America, and I really couldn't do it. But I said, um, I know we've got some old branding irons, and there are a few records, and I'd be glad to contribute them to the museum there at the park but I got the itch. And I did a little investigation of the history of the Callison Ranch, my grandfather's ranch. And then I got a little bit more involved. Seven, eight years ago, I went, I came both to the Library of Congress and to the National Archives to look for records. <clears throat> if you wanted to look at census records, and I'm sure some of you have done this, you went up to the third floor of the National Archives and some very kind people would wheel out on long rollers census books. They must have been six feet long and you open up those census books, and in tiny little script, there was a lot of good information. If you wanted to look at newspaper records, you went to the Library of Congress. And the Library of Congress uh, has you know, thou the, the copies of thousands of records, but they got modern and they put them on microfilm and microfiche. And I went there to go through the San Antonio newspapers and the Chicago newspapers to see what I could find. I, I'm sure some of you have tried to use those confounded machines and, and they end up bringing expletives out of one's mouth where, they, where you shouldn't because they got jammed up and again, you were, looking, you were looking for needles in haystacks. Part of the incredible communications revolution 
which is brings information that we could never find before. Two examples. Today, <clears throat> as most of you know, you can go in to Ancestry.com or into the National Archives website and with a flick of a finger or two, find the person that you were looking for, find the census records from many, many periods. I started getting excited about this discovery the first time I saw the 1900 census. And there was Nathan Callison in Chicago, Illinois. He was, li he was living in what was known as the Near West Side Ghetto, in which 16 nationalities of immigrants were packed into an area denser than Baghdad. And there he was. He had a one-room harness-making shop. He had one employee, and he lived in the back of the shop with his wife and his two infant children. That was very exciting. And then I discovered, and incidentally, I've, I've got a whole bunch of single sheets listing the major websites which uh, even experienced uh, biographers, some of them do not know about. And uh, they're here for your taking as a guide to, to the websites that can do you the most good. Newspaperarchive.com. I was with a bunch of authors last night at the dinner preceding today and very few of them had heard of newspaperarchive.com. Bring it up on your computer, put in the name of a city. It's not comprehensive of, of the entire United States, but I found the San Antonio newspapers going way back into the 19th century, the Chicago newspapers going way back into the 19th century, <coughs> Excuse me. And again, with the, uh, the wonders of the ability to uh, mine information, you put in a name and every single story that had been written about that person popped up on the screen for a very small, you, you get some information free with a very small fee, you have access to everything that is in newspaperarchive.com. My family, um, about which I'm going to tell you a little, uh, they ran a business, they had a ranch, uh, they were public-spirited citizens, they were famous by no means, but I found dozens, hundreds of stories, not only stories about uh, how the business did or cattle were sold, but stories about my mother at age 11 doing a piano concert. Newspapers in those days, and small newspapers still today, don't just report the big world events. They, re they report what's going on in people's lives. And via newspaperarchive.com and five or six other websites, I was able to reconstruct a pretty interesting history of what I think was a family that tells the story of America in the 20th century. So I, anybody who is interested, I would love to help them. A starting point uh, can be the list of these different resources. And I'm on there, nickcots.com. Anybody who wants any help, I will encourage 
and try to help them. Now, the Callison story, we did not know this story. There were uncles and cousins who were convinced that the Callisons came from Sweden, not from Russia. But the story, as I learned more about it, was this. Nathan Callison was one of three brothers who lived in a small village called Ladizinka in the Ukraine, not too far from Kyiv. I learned the history of 900 years of Jews in Russia and the czars who ranged from semi-friendly to cruel and brutal to Jews. I never would have learned that history if I hadn't gone looking for records of Nathan Callison in Russia. At the age of 17 in 1890, Nathan Callison's mother pushed him out the door and wished him well, and he began a long, arduous journey by foot, by wagon, finally by train to third-class uh, bunk on a ship heading for the United States from Germany. He brought his brothers out. He brought his mother out. They were in Chicago, Illinois, where, he, where again, uh, he started this business, this one-room harness shop in 1896. In 1896, we were in the midst of the greatest depression in this country's history until 1933. How did this man start a harness shop in those circumstances? And I began to develop some awe, not just about him, but about the people who came to this country between 1880 and 1920. I hadn't thought much about this, and I should have. 22 million immigrants, mostly from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe, came to the United States between 1880 and the late 1918. 18s. Think about what was going on in America. We were in the midst of the Industrial Revolution. Think about what this country, what, how this country would have fared if we did not bring these 22 million people into the country because they became the farmers, the laborers, the factory workers, the craftsmen, and yes, and then the scientists and the artists. It was one of the most amazing periods of immigration in this country's history. And I think it tells us, uh, it, it gives us a point of reference at which to look at the current question of immigration into this country. We would not be the same country if those people had not come. In 1899, Nathan saw some strange vehicles putt-putting down Michigan Avenue. They were automobiles. He was a man of vision, and he saw that the day of harness making and saddle making in Chicago and Illinois wasn't going to be so good pretty soon. So he headed for Texas, where the horse was still king. He went with his wife two small children. He rented a small space in downtown San Antonio, which he divided into his harness-making shop and where his wife and two children and he lived. A couple of years later, in 1901, he bought the first house he ever owned. Now, I found those records because the clerk of Bear County, Texas, 
and many other far-sighted clerks all over the United States are now digitizing property records. I could have spent 10 years and not found what I found with a couple of clicks on the computer. There was, I put in the name Nathan Callison, and out came several hundred transactions. In 1901, he bought this little house on Mission Street, and there was the deed. He paid for it half in gold and half with a loan from a bank, the Oppenheimer Bank, which was the only bank in San Antonio then that would lend money to Jews. And on the deed, there was his signature, Nathan Callison, written in Hebrew. And there was my grandmother, Anna Callison's name, marked with an X. That gave me a lot to think about. Here, the, here were these folks. Here were these folks, now 10 years out of Russia. And she was not writing English. She later did. And he was signing his signature in Hebrew. They came, they went a long, long way from there. In 1910, he bought a ranch. And this was a critical period in the history of farming and ranching in the Southwest. The cattle drives were now over. The United States Department of Agriculture and the A&M colleges and the new Extension Service were trying to persuade these ranchers to do some modern ranching and farming. And Texas ranchers were very stubborn. They liked the old ways. Nathan went along with it. His ranch became a model showing how farmers and ranchers could succeed in the 20th century. Ranchers shunned growing crops. That was something farmers did. But to succeed, ranchers had to start growing some crops. He led the way. People came to his uh, ranch, the customers who went to his store. His store had grown beyond saddles and harnesses into selling, selling everything a farmer or rancher could need. People came two-day trips by wagon to stop there and to shop with him. And on that ranch, they came and they saw what a farmer and a rancher could do with some modern techniques. This story took me through 75 years of American history. And wherever I went with Nathan Callison, I learned something about America. There was World War I and the great flu epidemic, which killed more Americans than, soldier, than our soldiers got killed. There was the Great Depression. And, the, and I, I learned so much about the Great Depression that uh, despite being a history and international relations major, uh, I didn't know. Uh, the, the Great Depression starting in 29 and going all the way through the 30s, not everybody was broke and out of a job. Some people were doing quite well. And the Callison store, my grandfather joined by his sons, Morris and Perry, they were doing quite well. How? They cut their prices to the bone and they extended credit to their loyal customers without any idea of whether they would ever be repaid. They had faith in the country. They had faith in their, custom, in their customers. And they got through the Depression. 
One of the things that they did, now I'm back to newspaperarchive.com. There's been a lot of debate, and you're going to hear from a wonderful historian after me, Richard Moe, who is really a wonderful historian of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's presidency. The Callisons signed up for the New Deal programs. People, uh, political scientists have been arguing in recent years, well, those programs really didn't do any good. If it wasn't for World War II, we never would have gotten out of the Depression. I think not. And I, here I was looking at the evidence. A full-page ad in the San Antonio paper talked about a new program, the FHA program, the farmers, uh, not the farmers part, the, the Federal Home Loan Administration. That was one of the New Deal's first programs, and it worked. Nathan Callison's ad said, we have the money to guarantee these loans from the government, and we have carpenters, plumbers, electricians who are out of work, and we will send them to work on your house. And there was a picture of a new house for $2,400 that was going to be built with FHA funds. The story goes on and on. But what I'm trying to tell you is what I learned after many years as a reporter and writing books uh, about government, labor unions, social history, what I learned is a great new appreciation of American history as you see it from the ground up. Not starting out by looking at who won the election or what the war was all about, but by starting out and looking at what individual American families have done with their lives. And I thought back again to those 22 million immigrants and their children, their grandchildren, and now their great-great-grandchildren and looking at my own family and the others, what they have made of their lives in the United States. I've changed my mind. Uh, it's, it was always trite to say we are, a, for me, we are a nation of immigrants and uh, with the usual rhetoric. But now I have more than rhetoric. I have a story of how this country works with the sweat, tears, brains, labor of individual families who have come to this country over 200 years and made it what it is today. I'd be happy to answer any questions. And after this is over, uh, I'm going to have uh, copies of that sheet showing you the websites uh, down here in front for anyone that wants them. Thank you. Many thanks for your excellent and very interesting presentation. Uh, I have a question regarding Nathan. How much of his Jewish identity did he maintain over the years? And whether he encountered any special uh, circumstances or experiences uh, in connection with his Jewishness? That, it's a good question. How did uh, Nathan Callison's Jewishness play out in the United States. When he first got here, uh, he was an Orthodox Jew in this amazing little area in Chicago where there were dozens of synagogues. Some of them didn't have more than 20 or 30 members. And he, and he was an Orthodox Jew. When he got to San Antonio, 
it was life in the Southwest was different. And Nathan and his wife wanted to be part of the larger society, and they became Reformed Jews. They dropped the old uh, kosher customs, the men and women sitting apart. They wanted to be part of an emerging modern America, but they maintained their Judaism. And uh, my wife, Mary Lynn, who is sitting here in the front row, who is a great author, and she and I have edited each other's every word of each other's books. Um, my wife, Mary Lynn, observed this morning how many bar mitzvahs we've gone to of the great, great grandchildren of Nathan Callison. They have remained Jews. A few questions. Did, no. Nathan, <laughs> did Nathan leave uh, Russia? Uh, what, did it coincide with a pogrom? Uh, there was a good czar who got assassinated in 1881, the good czar Alexander. Some Jews were naming their children after him. He was assassinated, and his son came in, and he was one of the very bad czars. And Nathan's mother, had, uh, the, the father had died when these children were very young. Nathan's mother hid these children as best she could until they were teenagers. Then she apprenticed them to learn how to make harnesses. That was, leather work was considered very dirty work in Russia, and it was one of the few crafts that Jews were allowed to do. But the Cossacks were coming. The Tsar had a policy of kill one-third of the Jews, convert one-third of them to the Orthodox Church, and per just persecute the rest of them. And Nathan's, uh, a lot of parents were afraid for their children to go into the unknown. She was not. This small little determined lady wanted her children to get out and to bring her afterwards if, if they could. And Nathan and his brothers escaped just ahead of the Cossacks coming through those shtetls, and they had a wonderful technique. They didn't have napalm, but they, they, everything had straw roofs. The houses had straw roofs. They simply set the roofs on fire and then shot the people as they came out of the houses. So yes, he, uh, Nathan was in the wave. In the period between 1880 and 1920, two million Jews escaped from Russia and Eastern Europe and came to the United States. Again, that was one of the largest migrations in history uh, of any group of people. Anyone else? Uh, and what happened to Nathan's mother? Do we know? Do you know? Yes. Kind of surprising. The boys brought uh, the mother to the United States. And again, thanks to all these the wonderful ability to, uh, for records, uh, she remarried. She was in her 40s, uh, and uh, she remarried. And then finally, um, the whole family was reunited in an amazing cemetery. It is the Waldheim Cemetery in Chicago. And, and here again is, I don't know whether it's serendipity or what, about 1 a.m. one night, you know how you kind of wander, you're sleepy, you wander around on the internet. I put in the word Ladizinka, L-A-D-Y-Z-H-I-N-K-A, and up popped one entry, Waldheim Cemetery. 
The Waldheims, there, there are 40 or 50,000 Jews buried in the Waldheim Cemetery. Um, I called a graduate student in Chicago who went out to that cemetery, checked in and found out where uh, people from various towns were buried. And not only did she find a half a dozen uh, graves Na of Nathan's brother and mother and so forth, a great mystery was solved because on those gravestones were embossed pictures of, of the people who were buried. For, for years, we had been trying to figure out who were the two other men in a photograph of Nathan that had hung on the wall in my uncle's house for decades. They were his brothers, Jacob and Samuel. That was, again, that opened up a whole new world because not until we saw those pictures did we know who those two fellows were. Yes, sir. Uh, you said that Nathan signed his name in Hebrew, but wouldn't it have been Yiddish as uh, a secular language? I'm told Hebrew, but I've got a copy of the, uh, it's a picture in the book, and I have a copy of it here, and please take a look at it. Uh, my experts say it's Hebrew. Could be. <laughs> oh, hi. I have two questions. The, the first question is, did Nathan suffer really some prejudice being, you know, being Jewish here in America? Just uh, how did he really get, really get to, to survive with all the troubles that, that I, I just know that, that sometimes some of the other Americans weren't, other Americans weren't always that welcoming. So what that, how did he really survive some of the, the prejudices and the difficulties that, that comes with being Jewish coming into to the country? And my second question, did you also do uh, research on your other part of your family, the, the Cotts family? Uh, my cousins tell me that's what I'm going to do next. Okay. <laughs> Tracing uh, anti-Semitism and difficulties and so forth was an obvious thing to do. In Chicago, <clears throat> the accounts of how the Jews, the Italians, the Poles, the Greeks, uh, the Lith Litwaks, how they treated each other are, are pretty trenchant. They had, uh, they, they each nationality had uh, ugly names for each other. They fought with each other in the street. Uh, Jews fared very badly in that ghetto. But it was a far cry from the Cossacks in, oh, yes, in, in Russia. In San Antonio, uh, the Southwest, and I think the South in general, uh, offered Jews somewhat more offered them more opportunity and, um, and less prejudice. Basically, I think, because there were few of them. Uh, we were not talking about tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of uh, Jews, but there was prejudice, and it wasn't just directed against Jews. It was directed uh, against uh, anyone who had a funny sounding name, uh, including Italians, Poles, and so forth. But kind of a, uh, an interesting story. S San Antonio was founded by the Spanish, but it was really developed by German families who came to the United States in the 1840s and the 1850s to escape a revolution in Europe. During World War I, those German families, some, some of which were, they were the bankers, the, uh, uh, the professors, the doctors, were treated horribly during World War I. 
There was a wonderful area where the German uh, elite lived, which was called Prince William. They changed the name of the avenue to General Pershing Avenue. During G General Pershing was the head of the American army. And even in World War II, there was some prejudice. Um, a German lady from the country sold, brought fresh eggs and sold them to my grandparents and to my aunts and uncles who lived close by. A lot of people stopped buying eggs from this woman who had to have been a second or third generation American. So prejudice there will always be. Nathan had an amazing ability um, to get to know and to get along with all kinds of people. His Yiddish gave him an introduction to German. He quickly learned Spanish, or at least Tex-Mex. And he was, he was a guy who loved people, and he communicated with people. He was a good businessman, but at the heart of his business was serving his customers. Excellent. Yes, ma'am. Hi, you, you mentioned people with funny sounding names, and I'm thinking Callison doesn't sound like a Russian name. I'm just wondering about that. <clears throat> Callison and its various derivations, Kielson, Killison, and so forth, uh, are fairly unusual, and that helped me a lot. Uh, a great thing started with Haley and his book Roots in 1977. I think we owe that man a great debt because Roots kicked off uh, a resurgence of people seeing the importance of family and knowing family history. And because there's so much interest today, there are a lot of freelancers in the Soviet Union, uh, that's no longer the, in Russia, and in the Ukraine, um, who for a fairly small sum you can hire to go look at Russian records, and there still are records. I, uh, with, with the help of uh, the gentleman that I hired, we found Callison's going back into the 17th century in this particular area. And of course, they came to, the, they came to Russia after the Spanish Inquisition ran them out of Spain and Portugal. The name is unusual, and uh, and that was very fortunate for me because it really cut, if the name had been Brown, I would have had a lot more trouble. Thank you. I just, uh, last month, I listened to a concert of Irving Berlin and there was a story of his life. Irving Berlin family came also from Russia same period that you came. And uh, also they escaped the Russian uh, uh, pogrom against the Jews at that time. And uh, he ended up in America. He was playing the piano. He was a musician before. Mm -hmm. But he ended up being one of the great composer of America. He was one of our greatest composers, and he was composing into his late 90s, which uh, is pretty in amazing. In the 1920s, he composed the great, uh, I love Irving Berlin myself. Ah, so do I. I, I want to say, sort of sum up something about the book. This book is not a memoir. Uh, I appear in it only as a child. and. Uh, I've been writing history for 
many years, and this book is not just a book about the Callison family. Um, I use the Callison family as the guiding family to take us through almost a century of our history. And thanks to that approach, I think I, I, I learn more about all the great events in our history by seeing how one family uh, was affected by them and the place where they lived. I learned so much, and I hope if any of you all are interested in buying it, I understand I'm between two and three o'clock, I'm gonna be on the book signing floor, and I'd love to sign some books for you. Yeah, time for one more. One more question. Now, I admit I'm a, I'm a close friend of Nick's, but I'm not a plant. <laughs> and I think there's a dimension of the book that he's neglected. He's told us wonderful things about the research and all that, but it's how much Nathan Callison and people like him contributed to building of Southwest Texas, building San Antonio, which is now one of the great cities of our country. And I think you ought to tell us just a little bit more, I know you're gonna run out of time, about that part of it. Nathan was always looking, uh, he was always looking over the next hill. In terms of him as a merchant, uh, Nathan was doing what Walmart did 50 years, 60, 70 years later. He saw the technique of Walmart. Now, a lot of us in cities and suburbs, we don't like Walmarts to become planted next to us. But for the small towns of America, uh, Walmart provided services and goods at reasonable prices uh, that they couldn't get without traveling long distances. And Nathan was really doing a Walmart as a merchandiser very early on. And uh, anything new that came along, this was a, this ended up being the largest farm and ranch supply store in the southwestern United States. But when television sets came along, he was right there as one of the biggest seller of television sets. After World War II, another great story to me, um, what happened after World War II? Suddenly we had 20 some odd million GIs came home. There was no housing. There were not jobs. And uh, Callison figured out how to deal with both of those issues. One, by creating jobs, and two, by figuring out how to help families buy all these modern new devices which were suddenly available. Freezers, uh, kitchen devices, new kinds of stoves. He was a man who was, he was always looking ahead and um, he served his customers that way and he succeeded as a businessman by doing that. Thank you all very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.